Now we're going to introduce our following speakers, Zach Group. Zach Group is an international design studio which shapes the contemporary visual culture. They create brand identities, digital platforms in the intersection of art, architecture, design and fashion. Some of their most recent work are projects for group object or Nottingham Contemporary or identities for the MM Cap Museum Arpoort for Moderne Kunst in Frankfurt. He has worked for fashion brands such as Paco Rabanne for rebranding project or exhibitions for White Cube, for instance. This is a very interesting studio, which I believe that opens a lot of doors and one of the most interesting examples, and I don't know if he will be uh, touching on it, but it's uh, the curator work that they do for M+, the biggest museum devoted to visual art located in Hong Kong, where for many years, uh, many years actually before opening the museum, there was a whole pro platform created by Zach Group where you can find all the curator aspect of the museum before the existence of the museum. Thank you, Zach, the floor is yours. I, I think it's, it's very nice when as an artist you can do something and you can do it today. Martin Kippenberger said, heute denken, morgen fertig. Uh, today thinking, tomorrow it's finished. All you know, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work into, in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualification and thus adds his contribution to the creative act. How we learn and what we learn is not altogether definable because it comes out, we're not people who are now writing lessons we're artists and architects. Is design a creation of an individual? No, because to be realistic, one must always recognize the influence of those that have gone before. Marshall McLuhan had said that culture was what most of the people are doing most of the time. Unless you bend the rule, unless you play with the rule, then the rules themselves fall into disrepute. And unless, and, and that sometimes it's rather better to, to um, ham up a situation which makes a particular rule absurd. Great. So um, the voices that you've just heard of artists and designers and architects and thinkers have all had a profound influence both on how I see the world uh, and the work of my graphic design studio, Zach Group, which I founded about 15 years ago. Design is not created alone, and in the words of uh, Charles Eam that you just heard, the influence, I recognize the influences of those that have gone before. Um, the title of my talk is Heute Denken, Morgen Fertig, Think Today, Finish Tomorrow, and I'll explain that a bit later. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, I, I thought about talks like these, and I remembered that as a student, uh, I went to talks much like these in the hope to learn how to invent my own uh, principles, as Dieter Rams had done um, with his 10 principles of good design. Um, as a student, I admired those historical designers and thinkers that were able to distill their thoughts into such a clear form um, that it became like a manifesto that guided their practice. To me, it did not matter if they called it a manifesto. And these are some of the, the works that I thought of being like a manifesto that, that inspired me. So, Archigram, uh, Fishley and Weiss, How to Work Better, Sister Corita Kent, Timeless Rules for Learning and Life, my favorite. Uh, rule being number seven, the only rule is work. And uh, Learning from Las Vegas by Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, and very, very notably designed by Muriel Cooper. I discovered, of course, that the problem with manifestos um, is, is their self-assurance. They represent the world as a place full of certainties. Um, and for that reason, when I set out to start a, a studio, 
uh, as a 22-year-old kid, I didn't want to write a manifesto. And now, after what seems like some time, I realize that all along, Zach Group, through our work, um, has been outlining a set of beliefs, um, and you can call it a, a toolbox or a personal design statement or a manifesto. So uh, we started to think, if we had written a manifesto, uh, what would it be? And to do this, I sat down with a, a small group of people in the studio um, and identified common threads that run throughout our work. So this presentation is as much about what our manifesto could be as to how one can create their own manifesto. So if you, if you have in you uh, one more manifesto for today, um, I'll offer you our nine-point manifesto. Um, one, give shape to culture. Uh, two, design an ideology. Three, build bridges. Four, apply generalism to specialism. Five, economic design. Six, think today, ready tomorrow. Seven, embrace aesthetic contradictions. Eight, open source the process. And nine, define the rules of the game. So for each point, I'm going to give a few examples from our work. Um, and this slide will, will come back. OK, so for the first point, give shape to culture. Um, at Zach Group, we see our work as a form of cultural production. We often ask ourselves, how can we give shape to culture? And we recognize that culture is, to quote Marshall McLuhan, um, what most of the people are doing most of the time. Culture is by no means limited to the cultural sector, and we're active participants in both the cultural and the commercial worlds. Considering the process of how to give shape to culture um, as a way of creating culture beyond just kind of packaging it um, can inform how, is we, how we as designers can take part in a creative process. Books are one way to shape culture, and I'd like to speak about uh, two different books. Um, Cedric Price, who you heard speaking earlier, was one of the most uh, significant thinkers in British architecture. His legacy was defined by impermanence and flexibility, and as you can see here uh, on his t-shirt, do it with an architect, also humor. Uh, my first example to illustrate this point is a book that I worked on over the course of three years um, called Cedric Price Works, a forward-minded uh, forward retrospective edited by Samantha Hardingham. Uh, we gave material shape to a legacy that's not widely known beyond uh, the architecture community. And the monograph is divided into these two volumes that you can see here, the first one being uh, a complete um, list of, of projects. Um, all of the projects are, are printed there on the spine. And the second book being a, um, a book of all of the articles and talks that he had given. And they're both contained within this kind of archival uh, case with metal edges, which is like the type of um, archival box that Cedric would have used in his office. Impermanence and flexibility are at the core of some of his best-known projects, including uh, this one, Fun Palace, from uh, 1960 until 66. It was commissioned by the kind of visionary theater director, Joan Littlewood. And uh, Cedric Price described Fun Palace as a, quote, three-dimensional activity framework that enables maximum flexibility and change. The volume draws upon all of the original archival material, um, including uh, a two-and-a-half-meter-long Leporello, which reproduces um, Price's 65 a City of the Future drawing, which you can see here. The project is divided into decades by this uh, thumb index and a series of notches um, run along the foredge of the book. Um, Cedric was, was an avid um, stamp creator, and each of the volumes is individually hand-stamped by one of his original uh, stamps for the Hot Stuff Club, which was a kind of mysteri mysterious group of which he was the founder and life president. For a career that resulted in very uh, little built work, uh, Cedric had the, had the last laugh and left us with a book that weighs about seven kilos. 
The second example of giving shape to culture is for the 57th uh, Venice Biennial, where we collaborated with the artist Anna Imhoff and the curator Susanna Pfeffer um, on the design of the German pavilion. Here we gave shape to Anna Imhoff's um, exhibition Faust through its identity. So to show you what that exhibition looked like, I've included a few images. Um, Faust was a four-hour production and seven-month-long scenario that combined performance, uh, painting, and sculpture. So here you can see performers that are under a raised glass floor in the German pavilion and performed over the course of the biennial. Um, our, um, and you can see here also some of the performers were wearing um, apparel with the title of the exhibition, Faust. As the, as the book uh, we published came out prior to um, the, the new performance-based work, um, our approach was to show Faust through a photographic narrative of actions and gestures that were performed by core members of the artist team. Um, so we didn't have any kind of previous work to draw from, so uh, the artist in her studio staged these um, photo shoots, and uh, on the, on the right-hand page, you can see um, what extracted uh, chat logs from WhatsApp, which the artist uses to communicate with her performers in real time. You can also see that on the website here. <clears throat> and so if you would leave the website inactive for a few minutes, then you would start to see these um, chat lines appear on the screen. A record composed um, for Faust will soon be released by Pan, and this is a, a preview of the, the cover. Point two, design and ideology. <clears throat> Our practice is um, not underpinned by a single idea, um, but instead each project represents the opportunity to design both a form and an ideology. Ideology, of course, is a, is a loaded term, um, but we are interested in how design can assign value to beliefs. Um, and design for us is what gives this ideology form. Our first project here is for the Berlin Biennial. Um, the ide ideology we designed for the Berlin Biennial uh, is that an identity can be speculative rather than definitive. Instead of a fixed logo, we use language and writing to narrate the biennial. At the core of the identity are these two brackets that form a um, halved eight, referring to the Berlin Biennial's eighth edition. Those brackets could be expanded and act as uh, a parenthesis that contains text that was commissioned by one of the Biennial's artists. So in this sense, the marketing became used as a host for an artwork, or, or it contained an artwork within it. So these are the kinds of posters um, and billboards that appeared throughout the city. What I like about this approach is that the identity took an active role in the curatorial program of the biennial rather than just representing it to the public. <clears throat> Our second example from a very different field um, is for the French fashion house Paco Rabanne. So here our um, ideology was one of conservation. Instead of abandoning the brand's history, we sought to find ways to preserve the design integrity of its original 1960s identity through careful uh, interventions. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the architect-trained fashion designer Paco Rabanne uh, unveiled his uh, 12 unwearable dresses in 1967. Um, the runway show was one of the first to include music and models of color, neither of which were done at the time. In its own ways, the original logo broke with convention. Um, by choosing to use all lowercase letters, the logo was rejecting the authority of the fashion establishment. We introduced uh, subtle interventions into the geometry of the logotype, uh, as you can see, see here in the before and after. 
Uh, when I say subtle, they're very subtle, um, almost imperceptible. The online uh, design critic, who goes by the name of Markintosh, put it more succinctly. And for us, that was exactly the point. In the context of the fashion industry's recent trend to redesign their histories, uh, our ideology of conservation felt like it mirrored the radical past of Paco Rabanne. In addition to the logo type, several monograms had been created over time. In the most successful, the R acted as a kind of um, counter space of the P. And here we conserved the structure, but evolved the form. So the new monogram was redrawn uh, using a monowit stroke to kind of express the, expose the structure and give the mark a lighter feeling. And it was used in different contexts, uh, including also um, w within the products themselves. Uh, we also introduced a new custom typeface, uh, Paco Sans, designed by Radim Peshko, one of our collaborators, that's used across the brand's uh, communications. Three, build bridges. Graphic design has the power to build bridges between an institution and its audience, a brand and its customer base, and from one discipline to another. Working with the curatorial team of M+, uh, the Museum of Visual Culture in Hong Kong, uh, which you can see here, uh, we developed a digital platform that creates a bridge between cultures and languages. Um, M+, is, is currently uh, in progress. As you can see, it will open in 2020 and will be one of the largest uh, museums of modern and contemporary visual culture and, and art in the world. And so our challenge here through the website was how we can create a website that provides a curatorial platform for a museum in progress. The cultural specificity of Hong Kong informed our approach to language and typography. Throughout the website, you can see here that all of the headlines are both in English and Chinese. Um, and when you click on one of the languages, it will automatically translate the page uh, into the other language. We also introduced another type of um, navigation, uh, which is more about exploring uh, topics and themes. And here, each uh, element of content is attached to either uh, a keyword or even an emoji. And the users can interact with these tags by selecting uh, or entering search terms uh, or responding to the website suggestions. So here, if you, for example, click on the three chickens, I don't know if you can see them over there, yeah, sorry. Uh, it brings you to a work called Artistic Chicken by Duan Jianyu. Four, apply generalism to specialism. At the start of our practice, our work consisted uh, pretty much entirely of designing books, and uh, primarily for artists and architects. We soon found that we were specialists operating in a rather narrow field, uh, which is often seen as a virtue. Um, the decisions don't get easier, but they become a little bit more routine. Choose a format, type size, binding. They even become predictable. Um, so soon we were confronted with new types of uh, challenges and scales that we knew very little about and had to change the way that we were thinking. Commissions changed from designing for institutions to designing institutions, from books to buildings to brands. And to become comfortable with these scales, we had to kind of rewire our thinking and apply a more generalist approach to new domains. Um, so these are just a few of those projects. This is the Friedrichianum in Kassel, uh, the Chicago Architecture Biennial, and uh, Astrid Fernley uh, Museum in Oslo. To embody this uh, generalist approach, we also created um, the publishing company Group Object. Group Object will um, publish objects that combine art, design, and fashion. And our first collaboration is on a, a range of uh, facsimiles um, of the apparel you saw worn by performers in the exhibition Faust. Uh, we're all, this is kind of a spoiler, but uh, it's still in production. We're also working on a um, collaboration on a bookshelf 
with the amazing artist uh, Marka Mishamovic, and you can follow this on the website groupobject.com. Five, uh, economic design. At Zach Group, we use the term uh, economic design to describe an approach to design which for us uses minimal resources to create maximum impact. The challenge of economic design is to intellectually and materially be efficient without being minimalist or functionalist. Uh, economic design should be totally economic. We were recently uh, commissioned to design uh, a new identity for the MMK in Frankfurt. Uh, the Museum for Moderne Kunst is one of Germany's most important uh, contemporary art museums. The economic element of our design proposal was to introduce a superscript MMK uh, trademark symbol. And that MMK symbol could be attached to individual words and phrases uh, to claim them as part of the museum's identity. We also uh, renamed the museum's three venues after the types of buildings that they occupy. The postmodern uh, museum building that you can see here, designed by Hans Holein, was renamed Museum MMK. The exhibition space located in the financial district was renamed uh, Tower MMK. And the former customs office was renamed using the German word Zolamt MMK. And the museum's membership uh, association was renamed Freunde MMK or Friends MMK. Improving the overall aesthetic experience of visiting the museum was for us not limited to the, the logo type. We couldn't resist to also design a new uniform for the exhibition assistants. Uh, and you can see some photos here I took on my uh, recent visit. Um, we, we even claimed Frankfurt as being part of the museum's identity um, by adding the MMK to, to different words. We can kind of claim them as being part of the museum's identity. So the second example of economic design um, was across the River Main in Frankfurt. And here we were commissioned by the State of Schule, which is a legendary art school, um, to create a new identity for them on the occasion of their 200th anniversary. Uh, the State of Schule was established by the estate of Johann Friedrich Stadel, a wealthy uh, businessman and patron of the arts. And for years, the school had used a seal uh, based on Johann's bust um, as their logo. And so when we were uh, invited to work on this project, um, our initial response was to digitally redraw the seal um, by 3D scanning the marble bust of the school's founder. So if you visit the State of Schule website, you can see Johan here. Um, and in addition to this new kind of digital seal, uh, we also introduced an upside down inverted logo type, which in a way signifies the school's independence and devil may care attitude. Six, think today, ready tomorrow. Uh, so this phrase that you heard earlier, we borrowed from the artist Martin Kippenberger. For Kippenberger, the punk do-it-yourself mentality meant that you could come up with an idea and have it finished tomorrow. Um, at Zach Group, that's the kind of unofficial studio mantra of the way that we try to work and on the relationship between theory and practice. Think today, done tomorrow, no meetings, no bullshit. Um, we tried to do that, but we're not always successful. Um, for Frank Ocean's Boys Don't Cry magazine, this quick uh, DIY methodology was behind our bespoke tight treatment, which you can see here on the magazine um, across a few different covers. And this hand-distorted masthead was made by literally scanning originals on a large format scanner, think today, done tomorrow. The second example, um, is for an artist book for Frederick Varslev, uh, As I Imagine Him. Here we responded to the artist's work very quickly and intuitively. Um, the jacket that you can see here refers to the artist's trolley paintings, uh, which are made by wheeling a trolley through paint and um, over the canvas. The catalog is divided into two main sections. On one hand, a section of color plates at the beginning, and then at the end, 
we created a second set of black and white images in which we appropriated his work. Seven, is embrace aesthetic contradictions. Taking contradictory positions within a single project or across a body of work uh, can create a new spectrum of possibilities. Contradictions can also lead to surprising results. Aesthetic contradictions were the, the premise, in a way, uh, of our identity for Vitra's exhibition, Typecasting, which you can see uh, here at, in, at the Salone del Mobile. The exhibition presented over 200 objects. It was curated by Robert Stadler, who came up with the concept of nine different groups or personalities uh, that were used to personify these objects. So you have the athletes, the compulsive organizers, the beauty contestants, etc. Our identity for typecasting uh, refers to the multiple definitions of the word typecast in English. On one hand, to assign an actress a role that fits their personality, or on the other hand, to cast letters for the use in printing. For each of these nine communities, uh, we selected a typeface that reflected its character. So the compulsive organizers are in Courier, the slashers are in Fritz Quadrata, uh, the dreamers are in uh, Mistral, for example. And each logo variant combines these distinct fonts, uh, and, and the pro it's the product of the communities that it belongs to. So you could be part slasher, part communal, etc. Uh, there's also a book that recently came out um, on the exhibition. Uh, eight. Open source the process. <clears throat> Our work is the, is the product of a group of people working together. Um, this is reflected in the name of our studio, Zach Group, that refers both to the team of people that compose our practice, but also to the extended network of collaborators that inform and contribute to our work. So this is our studio here in London. Um, and we view it as important to open source the black box of the design studio and the design process in ways that are both big and small. This post, for example, lists the 25 people uh, working mostly behind the scenes that were involved in the making of the book uh, for Frederick Varslev that I showed earlier, from the lithographer to the binder to the screen printer, etc. Um, we also do this in less visible ways, for example, through a paid internship program that gives designers a kind of hands-on experience in a design studio earlier on in their career. Um, <clears throat> this, this idea of open sourcing the process was uh, our, our kind of point of departure for the identity of the Lisbon Architecture Triennial. Um, and here we crowdsource the identity by inviting members of the public to become a generative force in the identity. So uh, on this website, the curators posted a series of questions which members of the public could respond to. Um, and so this resulted in an accumulation of statements from um, visitors in Portugal and beyond. And we took those statements and then used them as part of the visual identity. So they appeared throughout the city on, on posters, um, and also um, on, on banners. Uh, the last point, nine, design the rules of the game. We often think of our work as designing a set of rules for a game. If the rules are clear, then we can deviate from them, depart from them, without compromising the overall coherence of a project. We first started thinking about designing rules for a game when we were invited by the Pompidou Center in Paris who decided that for the first time they would like to create an identity for their temporary uh, multidisciplinary event, the Nouveau Festival. There were a number of issues that we were uh, warned about beforehand, so the rules were exceptionally clear. One, no logo. Two, no alternate typefaces. And three, no exceptions to the brand guidelines. At a certain point, we wondered why they called us, but we realized that the game was to devise an identity based on a single feature that was highly specific, but yet completely adaptable. So our answer was a color. And this color was not so much defined by particular chromatic qualities as it was by its name, New Extreme Violet. Our color was, of course, in addition to the Pompidou Center's own colorful history 
of pipes and girders that was part of the project designed by architects um, Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers. Um, each of the building's colors um, is a code, essentially, that represents a specific function, um, blue for air, yellow for electricity, green for fluid, uh, red for movement. That's why the escalators are red. And to this, we added our own addition, New Extreme Violet, which would represent the curatorial. And with this additional color, the museum's in-house team could carry on following all their own rules so long as they were using New Extreme Violet. Um, this project, unfortunately, ran aground fairly early on in the process. But through this unrealized project, we realized that as designers, we can design the rules for the game. So now we've come full circle. This is our, our thesis. Um, but these 10 points, like Rams's 10 principles, are not universal. Um, they're part of an evolving per personal design methodology. And uh, this presentation, as I said, is as much about what Zach Group's manifesto could be as to how you can look at your own work and draw out a set of, of principles. I think that we're all, in some way, writing manifestos through our work and our actions and the work that we put out in the world. Thank you.